Hello, my name is Rodney Neal and I'm a program manager at InSource Solutions. As an employee owner, one of my roles is to work with our clients to plan and organize projects. This is episode four of Extreme Factory Makeover, the Operational Efficiency Edition, and it builds on what we've learned in the first three episodes. In episode one, we address planning at a strategic level. I'm starting the conversation today assuming that we have a good high-level strategy that has identified an OEE solution that brings value to the business. In episodes two and three, we translated the strategic OEE solution into the project parameters of scope and cost. These are both foundation elements of a good project plan and I'm working with the assumption that we have secured both the correct level of management support and we have a properly matched budget. Today we're addressing the question, how do I build an OEE project plan? That is, we'll translate the strategy into a plan. There are some unique considerations for OEE projects and I'm happy to pull from my personal experience and the collective experience of InSource to share those with you today. As a note, future episodes on deployment and post-deployment will expand on some concepts that we'll address today as a part of a complete project plan. First, there are three elements of an effective project plan. By effective, I mean we have tools in place to manage the primary project metrics of cost, schedule, and quality of solution which implies the functionality delivered is complete and works as expected. I once encountered a home remodeler whose business card included the following outcomes. Good, fast, cheap. Pick two. That was his way of acknowledging these standard project metrics, but he seemed to be implying compromise is always required. My contention today is that a plan that addressed these three elements gives you the highest probability of achieving success for the targeted outcomes. The elements I'm referring to are a solid foundation, good methodology, and discipline execution. I'm going to use these elements as the framework for our conversation today. We'll examine each element as it relates to OEE projects. A quick note, for small to medium projects, our discussion today could be viewed as overkill, but our experience and general industry wisdom says that projects of any size must incorporate these elements scaled appropriately. Be cautious attempting to apply broad industry frameworks from sources like the PMBOK, that is the Project Management Institute, Project Management Book of Knowledge. Those tools are scaled to manage large projects, that is greenfield manufacturing site design build initiatives. We have excerpted best practices from PMBOK and filtered out or scaled down as they apply to a manufacturing IT project. The first consideration for building an effective project plan is to ensure that a solid foundation is in place. I'm going to describe the foundation in layers, much like you would find in a home or commercial construction project. Consider a three-layer foundation. As mentioned earlier in prior episodes in this series, we've addressed the first layer of the foundation in detail, that is scope, cost, and schedule. So I'm assuming that those blocks are in place, but let's do a cursory review. The first layer of the foundation includes scope of work. That's block one, which is a complete description of the work to be completed and identification of the areas where the solution is to be applied. Budget, which is block two, is based on the scope. Schedule, block three, is a realistic schedule based on the scope and budget. I'm going to concentrate today on the second and third layer of the foundation, which contain the blocks of methodology, leadership, and discipline. They depend and build on the first layer. An important point, if the first layer is insufficient, the foundation is flawed, and no amount of methodology or leadership or discipline can overcome the weakness. The project will eventually crumble into chaos, which means descoping or schedule adjustments and our budget overruns. So let's take a look at the second layer. Block one is methodology, which includes a project charter, an execution strategy, a governance and communication plan, references to configuration and development standards, an adoption and sustainability plan, and a test plan. Block two is leadership, which means a project sponsor is on board, that is the person who ultimately has authorized the expenditure, is the chief recipient of the benefit, and is the person to whom the project team makes appeal to break down barriers and approve changes when encountered. And the project team has been announced, that is a properly empowered project manager has been appointed and the resources charged with making the project a reality has been selected. The last layer is discipline of execution. More about that in a minute. Today we're postulating that good project methodology mitigates risk. 
There are other ways to mitigate risk which will be addressed in future episodes. For example, selecting the right technology and post-deployment adoption. There are three primary categories of general project risk. Any of these are potentially present in every manufacturing IT project. The first category is technical risk, many of which are people related. Examples of technical risk include weak sponsorship, poorly defined project scope, undefined or poor acceptance test criteria, undertaking technical challenges beyond the current skill sets, selections of unqualified or inexperienced service providers or contractors, unreasonable constraints including schedule expectations and resource availability, undefined or poorly defined project deliverables. These risks are particularly important for projects governed by a regulatory body, ineffective project methodology, poorly executed project management, or failure to plan for post-deployment support and sustainability. The second category is financial risk. Some examples of financial risk include an unrealistic budget, failure to estimate progress appropriately causing cost over overruns, failure to use good change management procedures which leads to scope creep which impacts cost, or poor project management resulting in poor cash flow. The third and final category is commercial or contractual risk. Some examples include failure to appropriately handle confidential client information or intellectual property opening up the possibility of financial loss claims by the client, failure to formally hand ownership of project deliverables to the client, failure of the project team to understand contractual commitments. There are others depending on whether it's an internally driven project or whether you're, you've engaged a third party to implement the solution or have requirements that dictate regulatory or safety compliance. In addition to general project risks, there are some specific risks associated with OEE projects. Examples include availability of machine data, that is an immature or non-existent automation layer is not capable of automatically supplying machine state and our downtime data. Lack of standard downtime cause codes or quality codes, for example the site may have never standardized on a common set of codes that enable correlation of data across areas. Undefined KPIs, that is the enterprise has not undertaken an initiative to identify and define key performance indicators. OEE proper has a commonly accepted definition, but there may be some other metrics that uniquely speak to the performance of your product and processes. No plan or procedures are in place to integrate use of new data into daily routines. You must anticipate and plan how the data is to be used. No definition on how to present data, for example in displays and dashboards. The inability to contextualize data, for example, order number is a typical factory context. There must be a plan to ensure that this contextual information is available and captured electronically. Tasks that address these risks must be incorporated into the project plan to ensure project success. So now, let's turn to methodology. Our approach to project planning and execution mitigates the general risk associated with a manufacturing IT project as well as the specific risks associated with an OEE project. Our organization and methods are optimized for what we call the four first principles of implementation of IT solutions. It's baked into our language and our approach. The evolution of technology application in manufacturing has shown us that a balanced approach which considers not just the technology but their overall work processes and how people execute them is what's required to receive expected benefits. We have refined this classic three-legged stool by adding discipline execution of the processes. This approach must be reflected in the project plan to ensure predictability, risk reduction, and achievement and sustainment of identified benefits. Over the next few minutes, we're going to drill into what constitutes a project life cycle. That is, the methods and practices aligned with these principles and designed to deliver results. A life cycle approach is where progress is measured at key gates and execution is governed by good practices. That is, it's a practical, phase-driven structure. There are five phases in our project methodology. Define, design, develop, deploy, and support. Additionally, there are three project management processes that cut across all phases. The management processes are manage, test, and adopt sustain. On the surface, this looks like classic waterfall project methodology and it does reflect some best practices from traditional project management plans. For example, the project is broken into phases with clearly defined activities and a primary deliverable for each phase. 
The approval of the deliverable is the gate to signal phase completion and readiness to proceed to the next phase. Progress is easily measured and reported. But there are some distinct differences in our approach. We have incorporated the latest concepts in agile project execution and post-deployment sustainability. These concepts are consistent with our balanced approach. Let me highlight those differences. The first difference is iterative prototyping during the design development phases. Modern application platforms support quick prototyping which supports a participative design phase and solicits buy-in from key stakeholders and application users. I'll show you an example of how this works a bit later. One comment now regarding how technology selection facilitates a project execution method like this which is more efficient and assured. The ability for the technology to support modeling of assets, business logic, and the user interface and to encapsulate those models in a way that they can be reused or modified and to perpetuate changes to existing implementations are key technical features. The next difference is planning for sustainability. Research and our experience has taught us that most applications ne never achieve their intended business benefit or naturally provide less benefit over time. As if some unstated second law of application thermodynamics takes over when the project team is dismantled our key early sponsors move on to a different position. The end result is that the new solution was not effectively integrated into the cultural routines. This will not occur naturally and must be integrated into the project plan and executed as any other phase of the project. It's as simple as this. You must plan to use the new system to drive improvement from the get-go. And lastly, most times a project team breathes a sigh of relief after startup and looks forward to a return to normalcy, that is, their other day job. But startup is the point where the solution begins to benefit the enterprise. As described earlier, this does not happen automatically. In reality, this is another iterative cycle, that is, an innovation cycle. Adoption is assessed, impact determined, and adjustments made. The focus is on incorporating the new capability offered by the solution into daily use according to prescribed actions. Several iterations lock in gains it at a new baseline and drive to new levels. These concepts will be explained in more detail in episodes 7 through 10 of this series. In summary, the best practice of iterative prototyping during design and development paves the way for adoption and feeds an innovation cycle from the very beginning of use. Keep in mind that these methods are scaled appropriately for the scope and size of the effort. So let's put on our project manager hats and take a look at an example project plan that incorporates these best practices. For discussion purposes, this is a medium size, moderately complex, full-featured, extensible performance management solution, which is being deployed as a big bang rollout, although normally some type of phase rollout is recommended. We're keeping it simple for today. It's organized according to the phase-driven structure mentioned earlier. It uses project team-friendly activity description and is designed to be easily understood and tracked for progress. I'm going to highlight key activities, milestones, or deliverables by section. The first section is project administration. The first activity is creation of the project execution plan. This is a comprehensive document which details the processes and methods for executing the project. The first team-wide activity is the kickoff meeting where the scope, budget, schedule, and pro project execution plan is reviewed with the project team and stakeholders. Routine status meetings are scheduled up front, for example, a weekly status meeting. The next section is the definition phase. The key deliverable is a functional specification, which is different due to iterative prototyping, but it's still needed. After the functional spec is created, it's a natural point to review the scope, budget and schedule and adjust the project execution plan if required. This could result in a revised statement of work. The next sections are the design and develop phases which are merged into one section for simplicity. This reflects the iterative approach. The key deliverables are a high level design, an adoption plan, and a finalized test plan. A draft test plan would have been included in the project execution plan. Key activities are prototype reviews and the factory acceptance test, or FAT. The next section is not a phase, but its purpose is to give visibility to interdependent tasks. Some examples of interdependent tasks would be 
the parallel activities required to expand the site infrastructure or to remediate or improve the automation system. The next section is the deploy phase which implies that a solution is ready to be installed and tested in situ, that is in the facility where it would be used. The key deliverables are end user documentation, configuration specifications, and installation procedures. The key activities are system commissioning, execution of the site acceptance test or SAT, end user and administrator training, and system startup support. The last section is support. This normally includes close technical monitoring during a stability period. And last but not least, there are a series of adoption assessment and innovation activities designed to ensure that the solution is delivering the expected benefit both now and into the future. As mentioned previously, this will be covered in detail in future episodes because it, because it is a key determinant in success. So finally, let's turn our attention to project execution discipline. Remember it was that final block in the foundation that's key to success. Lifting from Robert Burns into a mouse, just like life, no matter how carefully a project is planned, something may still go wrong. An effective plan assumes that something will go wrong and supports a way to monitor and report progress and accommodate changes and get things back on track. This requires project execution discipline. So here's how we set up for good execution. Most key milestones are identified very early in project planning. A detailed project plan by discipline, where discipline might be the organizations representing operations, engineering, IT, quality, etc., is built around the milestones. This yields a master plan, which is used as the primary tool to communicate and measure progress. Often, larger projects will be reduced to some reviews to highlight things like the critical path and to make it easier to report progress. Another summary review is a project dashboard which would typically be used to communicate project status during a periodic meeting which could be a weekly team meeting or a monthly management review meeting. Remember that the tools and methods are scaled appropriate to the scope and complexity of the project. So there's many moving parts to an effective plan. In summary, we've taken a look at methodology, leadership, and discipline. I hope it's been beneficial. I'd love to have the opportunity to discuss these topics and more in detail with you. Don't hesitate to reach out. Be sure to tune in next time when the topic will be, what is the right technology for our OEE improvement project? Thank you, Rodney. Hello, everyone. My name is Ann Kroom. I'm an employee owner at InSource and also its president and CEO. Well, we hope you all enjoyed Rodney's presentation today on how to build an effective OEE project plan. There are a lot of moving parts, but it doesn't have to be a complex process. Let us know if we can help. And we hope you'll join us again in two weeks for episode five, where the topic will be, what is the right technology for our OEE improvement project? You'll hear how to determine if you uh, need a new software tool, and if you do, what software to use, what are the OEE solutions out there? And how do you pick the best one for your organization? What should you look for? And as well, we'll have time to ask questions to our experts. So please go to our website now and sign up for Episode 5. Now finally, you know, we all know that 10% improvement is doable. We've seen it. But the results vary. So as Rodney says, if you'd like to have an in-source consultant visit your plant to see what type of results are possible, contact us at the number on your screen or at www.insource.solutions. We'd love to work with you. And I'd like to close by reminding you of our 10% Extreme Factory Makeover Challenge Contest. If you already know or just suspect that 10% improvement results are within reach for your organization, but just don't have the budget to get started right now, we have an answer. We're putting our money where our mouth is and offering a free two-week engagement from InSource and Wonderware. Now this is a $45,000 software and services value. And you can register to win that on our website. Now we think this contest aligns beautifully with our InSource purpose to help you become more productive and profitable. So we invite you to take the 10% challenge See you next time.